I can tell I can tell we've gotten into the afternoon a little bit. Folks have started to filter out and fill the hallway track. But thanks for st sticking around and um, sticking with us for the rest of the schedule. This is App Developer Con. Um, for those of you just wandering in, um, if you were expecting something else, then uh, you might want to look at the maps. Um, I don't know. When I started, when I started, there were maybe two of the two or three of these. I feel like, and now it feels like there's a lot of these Day Zero events. But at least they're all on different topics. So, um, you know, you won't you won't catch me at the networking ones. Um, but uh, let's see. So, how many folks are going to take back? one or more of the things that they've seen today already and try them with their team? How many folks are going to take back everything and try them with their team? Oh, good. <laughs> um, yeah, so there will be a survey at the end as well um, where we're looking to find out what kinds of talks you want to see at the next one. So... Keep that in mind as you go through. We, we tried to get a good diversity of different topics here, but if you feel like we totally didn't give your favorite topic enough time and space, you know, whether that's JVM performance tuning, which I'm sure most of us here are super excited about JVM performance tuning, but if you are, tell me, because I could have made the wrong call. Um, or, you know, whether that is, you know, how to, you know, how much code goes into your application and how much code lives inside cars alongside it. Um, I'm sure the Dapper folks would love to talk your ear off about that if that's the thing you want to hear. Um, but uh, we are getting up to time for Kyle to start his talk. So um, we haven't talked at all really about CI yet, but if your code is not getting from your laptop or from your repo to production, I'm going to guess that the rest of the app developer stuff doesn't really matter. So I'm going to hand it over to Kyle to talk about CI pipelines as code. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, before we dig in, uh, we'll do like a quick experiment. So there's no raising hands. Don't worry. But like when you think about CI, like what, what emoji face does that spark in your brain? Is it like cool sunglasses? Is it angry face? Is it upside down smiley? Um, and that's going to be different for everyone, but hopefully, uh, you know, it's not too bad, but some people I know, you know, it can be a real pain if it's not um, a great system. So moving on from that, you know, if, if your CI is fine, all that, do the same thing with YAML. When you think about YAML, uh, do you have like a really like cool sunglasses face? Do you love YAML? He doesn't like YAML. Uh, <laughs> um, and then kind of think about the same uh, association you have with writing code. So whatever your favorite language program is, um, you know, writing Go, writing Python, whatever, like what emotion does that spark in you? And is that something that um, you, you enjoy on, on a day-to-day -day basis or would you rather write YAML? Um, and for me, it's code. So hopefully we can, uh, we can all agree on that. So today we're gonna talk about CI pipelines as code. Uh, and in this context, Code is code, um, and I'm Kyle. So uh, here's our quick agenda, um, and you don't have to memorize this because I'm going to help along the way, so don't worry. I'm your guide through CI Pipelines as Code. So first of all, what's up with all the YAML? So we're going to take a little journey of what you know a typical app goes through when you're starting with a brand new app and, and how you get to this place where you're uh, drowning in YAML soup, uh, as, as we like to say. So day one of your application, uh, you've got this YAML. And actually, maybe it's more like day 30 of a brand new app, right? So you've got some CI, and it's like, what, 13 lines of YAML. Um, and whenever you push to main, it's going to check out and install Node.js and run this uh, Node script. And so right now, you're probably feeling pretty good. You're like, sweet, like I'm doing CI. And it's true, like you are. This is really great. But... Let's, let's take it forward a little bit. And you're like, okay, day 40. We're still doing okay. It's still manageable, but we've got more requirements now. Our app is growing. We have more people contri contributing to it. 
And so we also want to run stuff on pull requests. Maybe we have some checks that go in. Uh, so we have a little bit more YAML. And then the thing about CI, unless you're one of these CI diehards like some of us at Dagger, is it works and then you forget about it until it doesn't work again. And so let's fast forward a little bit. Down the road, now you've got this little sm tiny snapshot of what all of your CI is. So you've got you know, a thousand lines of YAML. No one person understands 10% of it. Uh, contributing to it is a nightmare, and you don't want to be the one person that has to upgrade whatever action or whatever image you're running on. Um, and it, I mean, go back to the emoji faces, like all the things that you might feel when you're looking at this right now. I'm sorry if it's triggering. Uh, but yeah, this is like just the reality of the, the evolution of CI for any application is that you just keep adding more YAML in and, and you keep adding it and eventually you're like, what have we done? Uh, um, and so you get this kind of, this core team, like as you grow this, wh whether they're um, just a, a subset of your engineers or if it's a platform team or a least engineering team, that become the YAML wizards. And they're the people that get to change CI because either nobody else will or you know, I mean, looking at this YAML, like, is it super clear what's going on? If you work with GitHub Actions, maybe it is because it's an easy example. But like, you get this this set of YAML wizards. Uh, I used to be one, uh, so I, I know what that life is like. Uh, and you end up with a lot of PRs like this, where you make a PR to update something in CI, and you change a bunch of YAML, and then the PR review is just like, okay, sure, like I don't know what you're doing, but I approve. And that's really bad. Like, <laughs> but that, that's literally everywhere that I've worked on CI. That's exactly what happens. Um, and so how do you get away from that? Um, and in my opinion, as you might have gathered from the title, that CI is code. So you bring in this, this code that's doing these same processes, but you get so many advantages of writing code. Um, and we'll go into some of them, not even uh, a, a, a lot of them today, but you get to compose your pipelines and your workflows using this code, and that means when you make a pull request to change something, even if the person reviewing doesn't fully understand like your whole CI stack, they can look at that change and decipher more of like what the meaningful change actually is. And and when you're writing code, that also means this change that I'm making, I can validate it first. I don't have to push it to CI and then run an actual CI workload against it. Right? Like that's such a backward system, um, which brings us to our next point, the push and pray. Uh, and I didn't make that phrase up, but if you come by the Dagger booth, that's printed on the booth, because um, that's uh, a great way to phrase what CI has become, right? So like, you've got these thousands of lines of YAML, and this is like, it's, it's funny, but like, how many of you have a repo where you've had something like this somewhere in your commit history? Like, Everybody, right? Like it's crazy, and so like, how does this happen? It's because this, the YAML for your CI is this language that only your CI platform understands, right? So when you make a change to it, you can look at it with your eyes and try to be the CI platform and be like, oh yeah, that's going to work, and then you push it, and it's like, oh no, you missed a space, or you know, like if you can lint CI with your eyes, that's really great, but that's still not enough, right? So you get this world where you push things up and you hope it works. And even if it's not iterating on CI, even if it's you know, working with your actual application, so like the stuff that you actually want to do with your day and not fixing CI, um, you know, you NPM run tests on your machine and it works, then you push to CI and it doesn't work. Why? Because your, your machine's not the same as CI. Uh, but maybe we can fix that, right? And so you also get this, uh, this horrible edit of the classic XKCD meme of, this really long feedback loop because okay, if if I can't trust my local machine to to do these same tests as CI, then what's the point of running them? I just have to push to CI and wait to see if it's green, and so that means we're relying on CI for so much. But again, as we saw that YAML over time, that's more and more. So now you push and wait like what 30 minutes? How many people have a CI that takes longer than 30 minutes? Okay, it's too many. I don't want to look. Put your hands down. Um, <laughs> But that, that's, that's the, the thing, right? Is you have this really long feedback cycle of like, I've made this really simple change. I can't trust my machine to validate that, so I push to CI. And so let's fix that. So we want to make local the same as CI. And that's not with 
mocks or running CI from our machine. Like, we're not running a CI engine on our machine. We're not running remote access into our CI platform for our machine. We're not doing any of that. We just want to run the exact same thing within our development machine as we're running in CI um, and wherever, right? So how do we get there? So let's look at some code. So I've got this cool demo application. Um, there have been some really cool demo applications today. So I'm jealous of the works that some of you all put into your demos. Um, but we have this really, really cool one called the Greetings API uh, that I use for a lot of demos. And so if we look at this, we've got this. It's written in Go. Uh, so we've got a, a Go API, and it, it listens on a port, and it returns a greeting. And we'll look at that so I can prove that to you. Uh, but we've also got a front end that shows our really cool greeting on a website. And so if we look at, uh, just look at our main gut.go, and we can see that this is going to return this function, or it's going to return the string hello kubecon, um, or I guess hello app developer con. Uh, I would change it, but that would make our tests fail, and that would be really embarrassing. So, um, so that's that. And, I promised I would do as much as I could with one hand, but how do you exit Vim with one hand? It's impossible. <laughs> I'm trapped. <laughs> Sorry, I can't. Twice. We're saved. All right. We can still do it with one hand. Okay, so um, and I've also got this front end, and the front end is a, a Hugo site. So we, you know, in this fake application, we're developing Go. We want to use the Go tool chain thing on the front end. So Hugo is, um, if you're not familiar, it's a static site generator written in Go. Um, the details aren't important for the demo, but the main thing is we've got a bunch of Go stuff going on. And so if you think about the CI CD for this application, um, you know, we've got Go tool chain, so we probably want to do like build test lint against some Go things. Uh, I mentioned the Hugo site, so we want some way to build our, our front end site. Um, and then we probably want to like deploy things at some point, right? Um, so let's start with that, that Go toolchain stuff. Um, so if we look at this, we're going to be using Dagger um, to build our CI CD for this application. Uh, so that means we can write our CI CD in code um, and run it anywhere. So that fits our, our requirements that we looked at earlier. So I'm going to start with this module uh, just to work with Golang. And so it says that it's a module for uh, lint test and build. So that's perfect. So let's look at. Um, what this actually, what the code is here. Uh, One-handed, look at that. Um, so we've got some Go code, um, and we've got a function that does a build, a test, and a lint. And so, so the lint is a great example of like something that might work on your machine and not in CI, or maybe vice versa, because like how many different linters are there, and how, like what are the differences between individual versions of those linters, right? So within this code, we can say for organization, like, this is the way that we, we lint go. And this is going to run the same thing when we push it to, to GitHub Actions or, or CircleCI or wherever, but also on, on your um, development laptop. So we can say, um, you know, using the, the Dagger SDK for Go here, we can use this lint image. And again, we're saying we want to use the specific version of Golang CI lint. And then we're running the specific command. And so we don't have to, like, copy and paste this between like GitHub Actions and some make file and some other things. We just have one place that this is defined. Um, and we can say the same thing for like this function that gives us a base image. Like anywhere in our organization that we want to run something on Go, we can define like one time what that looks like. And so we have the same Go version, we have the same environment variables, the same configurations, and so on. And so let's actually use that in our application to, um, to do our build test lint for our back end. So I mentioned like in this project, we got the front end back end. So we've got the CI module here and we've got a back end and a front end directory within that. And then the main.go that's going to pull those together for like the, the, the total CI for our thing here. So let's look at back end. And again, we're, we have that same kind of interface that I talked about. So like test, lint, build. And again, that test is going to use that module that we just looked at. So this is where we're referencing that Golang module that I just looked at. Um, and test lint build. And we don't have to think about the implementation details or you know how Go is being run here. 
Um, and then we can also add a few more functions to this. So let's say um, I want a way to get just my backend binary. And so we can say that we're actually building this dependency DAG between our functions here where it's going to um, do a build and then give us the specific binary out of it. Um, and maybe we want to be able to get a container for this too. So when we deploy it, we say this is how we build like a, um, a multi-stage uh, image for our container or for our deployment. So we're going to do that build just like we did before, except this time we're going to get a, a Wolfie image so we can deploy this thing in production without any vulnerabilities. And again, we don't have to think about how these different pieces are coming together. It's just going to happen the same way. And as a bonus, we have a little function so that we can run this as a service too. Because if you think about all the things you're instrumenting in CI, like all those processes are how you want to run and test the application too. So you probably want to run this service on your machine. So we'll take a quick peek at the front end as well and then look at how these tie together. So I mentioned earlier that like we've got this Hugo site and here we happen to have a Hugo module. And so with the Hugo module, uh, you know, we can, we can build our static site and it's just going to give us a directory that contains the, the compiled site. And uh, same idea, if we want to serve this to our machine, we can just dump that in an Nginx image and we're good to go. So to pull it together, Now I've got my test, and again, it's just calling to that backend module where we already defined our test. And um, when we look at our build, it's going to look at our backend, get that binary, put that in a directory for us, uh, look at our front end, um, put that in a directory after it builds, and so on. Um, so before we go on to like the deployment side of things, let's actually like run this stuff, um, and hopefully the internet cooperates. So. Using the Dagger CLI, uh, we're going to call test, and we're going to pass in this argument dir, and that's a directory with our current working directory. If I go back to this real quick, we can see here's our test function, and the uh, important bit here is we have this parameter called dir, so that's what we're actually referencing here. And so if I run this, internet, yeah. Uh, and so it's going to compose all those images that we talked about, um, it doesn't care what's on my machine, right? I, I, it doesn't matter what my Go tool chain or whatever I have. But we ran this uh, test, and we can see it's cached, and we, we passed our test. And so now when we push it to CI, CI is going to run the same thing, right? So let's uh, make things a little bit cooler here and go on to the deployment side. So uh, actually, bonus, before we get there, I mentioned like we can serve things and run things on our, on our machine. Uh, so let's just do that real quick. Uh, so I showed that like the way we could just return these containers and run them as services. Uh, so if I want to run my whole stack on my machine, I don't have to like open 30 different terminals or uh, maintain a Docker Compose that's separate from the rest of my stuff, right? Because again, for those of you that, that are, um, you know, strict enough to maintain a Docker Compose of your project, like, does it drift from your actual images? And Yeah, right. So with this, this is running the same code that you're running everywhere else. So when I run this, again, fingers crossed for the internet. Um, it's going to pull those images, and it's going to give us a service for our back end and a service for our front end. And it's just going to forward them both to our host here. And so we can see we have 8080 and 8081. And if we go to a browser here and say localhost 8081, here's our super cool front end. This is a Hugo site. I didn't make that theme. Um, and then we have that little string that we saw from our backend API, hello KubeCon. Uh, so we're looking at our both of our services running here. Uh, awesome. All right, so let's go back and look at some cool stuff. So uh, let's say we want to release some code too. Uh, so in this case, we're talking about, you know, creating a GitHub release. Um, so again, got a module for that. Um, and so we can see that, you know, we pass in a directory. And in this case, we're going to get that build that has our front end and back end. Um, we'll put the front end in a tarball for this release. I don't know what you want to put in a release asset for your front end, but this is what we're doing for this project. Uh, so we have, we call this GitHub release module and then call create. Um, Deploy. So now we're going to deploy our front end back end to uh, 
the back end to fly.io, and the front end to Netlify. And so here, doing things a little more complicated, but um, we could probably make a module for this too, right? But we're making a, a multi-arch image for our back end, because uh, I don't know what architecture I'm deploying to. Uh, on my machine right now, it's ARM, but maybe the machine in Fly is um, x86. So we make this multi-arch image, push it up to Docker Hub, and then, of course, we got a module for Fly, and we call deploy on that, and that's going to deploy that back end on the front end. Got a Netlify module, get to call deploy on that. Um, and so one of the cool things, like we've been talking about Go all day, and if you're not a gopher, then I'm sorry about that, but um, what if we have a look at this Fly module real quick? Um, all right, I have to use my other hand. Hold on. Here's our fly module. Um, it's written in Python, but as we saw before, we're actually using it in Go. Um, and from the, the consumption side of these modules, you don't really care what it's written in, right? Because you just care that it's doing the task you ask it to do. So um, if you've got this big ecosystem of Python engineers within your organization, they want to write all these components in their language, that's fine. You don't have to make them write Go if they don't want to, um, because you can use it in whatever language you want to use it from. And so from this fly module, I'm doing this super secure templating of a fly config and then pushing up to fly with the CLI. Um, but yeah, the important part was like from this, uh, from this def deploy function, like I didn't really care that the, whoever wrote that module was not using Go, I'm just using it. Um, and then from our actual CI context or maybe from my machine before I get push or, or just as I'm iterating, um, you know, we want to wrap all those different steps to say, my CI, I want it to build test lint like we talked about before. So I just make another function. Um, and I'm just going to wrap those other functions that we talked about. So lint test. Um, and then another fun part. Um, aside from, you know, with, with your CI configuration today, um, aside from the YAML being proprietary, the other part that makes it hard to be portable is that you have all this environment configuration that you've typed into the GitHub Actions web UI or, or into um, you know, Argo or wherever you're defining your CI environments. And so that means that if you don't run in that environment, then your settings are going to be completely different, right? So uh, this is separate from CI CD as code, but stop putting your secrets in your CI. Um, you should use a, a secret provider for that. And so in this demo, we are. Um, and so this one happens to be uh, using something called the InPhysical, which is just a um, uh, secret provider SaaS. And so uh, I just have an InPhysical token, and I'm saying in my code, you know, I want to go with this InPhysical module and get this GitHub release token, and it's going to go grab that uh, for my dev environment. And the cool thing with using that pattern is that, you know, obviously you don't want um, all your developers and your CI, like fighting over the same set of credentials and deploy targets or whatever. But as a developer, if my token gets me one set of credentials that deploys to you know, a preview environment rather than the same place that my CI deploys to, then that's all controlled through authorization rather than through some set of environment variables. So uh, in this case, yeah, we're just grabbing this GitHub release token and doing our GitHub release and then same with like grab fly, Netlify, Docker Hub, all these things, and so we've defined our secrets in a place that handles secrets and not in, uh, in CI. Um, and then to take it one more step further, we've got all this stuff in code, uh, and our, our CI can run that code, but you know it doesn't have to. Uh, you know we, we don't have to still run all these GitHub actions in our in GitHub actions because, and that's an overloaded word. So thanks GitHub for that one. Um, but we don't have to run GitHub Actions still for putting this all in our code. So um, let's remove the, the checkout step as well and just say, I, want, I just want a command where I can give a commit for my project and it's going to run the CI on it. And that way, if you're reviewing someone's PR, you don't have to go check out their code and run their tests or even look at the checks at GitHub. You can just run CI with their commit and it's going to work, right? Um, definitely. Uh, so that's... That and so we can run this all locally, and we can also run this um, in GitHub. 
So I'm trying to do this with one hand again. Boom, got it. Um, so let's look at Circle CI first. Um, let's go, we've got a bunch of YAML, um, and we've looked at enough YAML today, so I'll just skim over that part. Uh, but we just call that same dagger call with that CI remote. And like I mentioned, we're just gonna pass in that commit. Um, and that's it, right? And so if we want to do the same thing in GitHub Actions, same thing, we're just gonna call that function with that commit. Um, and I know that people here are gonna like this one if we run a, wanna run the same thing in Jenkins. Hey, it's the same thing, awesome. So by doing this, you know, we, we've broken free of writing all that YAML. Um, we've written code that people you know, if, if they're looking at uh, this code and you make a change to how this commands run um, or, you know, the version of something, you're not just making a, a git diff that's changing some YAML, you're making something that people can understand and write tests for and run themselves and all these things without pushing it and waiting for it and so on. Um, so that's that. And if you want to go try it out yourselves, um, check out dagger.io. Uh, we've got a booth here um, where I'll be giving like a much deeper version of that demo if you want to see it uh, with much more Dagger things attached to it. Uh, we have this quick start guide. Um, and then also check out uh, Mauricio's book because he's actually got a section on Dagger in there. So check it out. Thanks.